party. Well, one day he comes out and uh, he was he was he was wound up before the show. He was a, a, not in a good mood. He's over on my side of the stage and uh, he throws a scarf at this lady. She grabs it and throws it back, and it just floated right down on him. And instead of taking, you know, smiling at her and going to give it to somebody else, he it pissed him off. He went and he, right, right to her, and she took it and, right back to him. And she's just drunk and laughing. Oh, 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 this is great. I'm getting all this attention. Well, he's driving down with a wall, and I'm standing there behind the curtain. And I said, oh, shit. I could see this, this wasn't going well, because he'd forgotten about the show, and he got a picture of a scarf back and forth with this lady. And he finally, boy, he read back and just threw, threw the hell out of it and walked, walked off. He thought about this the whole damn show while he's doing it. It was a terrible show. And after the show, we got out and said, why the hell didn't you come out there and stop that, man? I said, stop a lady from throwing a scarf? I mean, I'm supposed to walk out in the middle of the show and chew a lady out who, you know, who's doing nothing but throwing a scarf. He said, God damn it, don't, you know. Don't talk back to me. He, he, he got quiet. In a few minutes, he come out, I mean, at a very fast pace. And he, he always had that, that gun. He was, he was trying to pull this gun out. I said, God damn it, don't you ever talk to me in front of the <coughs> security like that. So I just, I just turned around, leaned on the bar, you know, and he, he came right, right in front of me. And I'm waiting, you know, if he's going to do something, he, he's going to get one shot. And that's, you know, when Sonny, Sonny saw this, he stepped in. I said, come on. I mean, that was... You know, what's wrong? What is wrong here, you know? And he said, I'm not having anyone speak to me like he spoke to me, and it, it was already starting to settle down because he knew if he didn't, he was going to be in a lot of trouble. And Red left the bar, went into the, the kitchen. We got a stand-up freezer, refrigerator boy, and he hauled off all of a sudden and hit that freezer door, and a big dent just went in it, you know? And uh, he said, damn it, what is this about? I've had it, I've had it. So there again was the thing where Elvis could push you to a point, and he knew when to stop. Well, he, he got handy with a gun there in Vegas. <laughs> there was some funny instances. Uh, the, the breakfast table, of course, breakfast was like 5 or 6 in the afternoon. It was kind of up, up three steps the off room, to man. the dining room. And we all, you know, all the guys come in there, you know, talking loud. He was at the end of the table. And he wanted uh, our attention. He said, hey. And everybody just kept talking like Lamar usually does. He just yak, 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 yak. Back and forth. He said, hey. He just, nobody, he everybody talking, ignored him. Nobody everybody stopped. ignored him. He took the gun and said, boom, boom, boom. And you can hear the bullets ricocheting around up there. Everybody hit the floor. Like Lamar grabbed his heart. Last table. We it was that thick. We dived on it. I ran into you. We hit, I hit look it up. And, well, you hear those bullets ricochet. It would rain, the though. It would rain up there, and the rain. Oh yeah, the, after that, after that, it was like a, you know, you could put your flowers under there and keep them and alive. The hotel said we don't understand what's going on. They they said why is it? They said we just didn't put the stuff up there right. So they had to go re, they had to go retar it. You know, they never could understand why it was leaking. It'd take off sometimes about a day or so, and then we'd start going around the strip and and seeing other acts, you know. And so we went over to the landmark, and there was Jimmy Dean and. Uh, the Imperials were backing. So something happened where Elvis invited them, and uh, I, I, I guess Jimmy Dean was invited, I don't know, but I know he told the guys, y'all come on over to the hotel. So the, the Imperials and Jimmy Dean arrived there, and we're all sitting around talking and everything, and time's going on and on. And they're out there a little over an hour now, and uh, no Elvis. Imperials didn't mind. I mean, they, they had worked with Elvis, they knew. But Jimmy Dean wasn't appreciated you know, being out there like that. So Elvis, in a little while, come walking out of his room, coming down those steps, and Jimmy Dean was standing there next to the, the bar, and he saw him, he started walking towards him, said, I ought to rip a yard and a half out of your ass for keeping me waiting this long. And Elvis, boy, put that, took that gun out, put it right underneath him, chin, and said, I ought to shoot your damn brains out for even talking to me like that. And Dean was just like this here, and Elvis, <laughs> just kidding, Jimmy. And walked off. Yeah, he had done the show. And we got stuck going in there first. We got stuck. It was raining. I <laughs> put it in reverse and forward, roof, and I got it out. And I didn't, I didn't hurt it, but he was outside and it slung mud on him. <laughs> so we got in the car. He went down, did the show. We met two girls. After the show, we went over to their apartment, 
nothing outrageous, you know, sit around talking. Then we went to this little gas station restaurant right in the middle of Grenada. It was about the only thing that was there then. And we're over in the corner. We'd order cheeseburgers or whatever, and these two rednecks walk in. And I never forget this. This little jerk walked in and said, Dad, the son of bitches. Walked over and sat down at the counter and I said, What the hell is he talking about? And he saw this mud on the seat of Elvis' pants. After, after saying a few derogatory remarks, I'm sitting there listening to this stuff, trying to let it slide. But then he said, Look at him. He, look at he's shitting in his pants. He's so scared. And I said, That's it. Elvis, Elvis, no, 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 no. I said, no. And I said, That's it. <laughs> I walked over, this little guy was sitting at one of those little spinning <laughs> stools. Yeah. The other guy was standing here. And I said, man, is something bothering you? He said, yeah, you and your freaking friend over here bothering me. I got something here in my pocket to take care of both of you. Well, he reached in his pocket, and I hit him, and he spun around off that stool <laughs> right on the floor. <laughs> and, I got on and I got on top of him, and hit him a couple times, and then I felt something grab me here, and I just automatically spun around and caught the other guy around the chin. His head hit right between Elvis' feet. And <laughs> that was it. Oh, man. My first reaction, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah, Cops right. coming. We're going to jail. And let's see through the glass. Elvis doesn't explain to these guys. <laughs> these guys. And then to see him have these mood swings, you know, uh, more frequent. And, and it was scary. You know, it really was. And uh, I didn't like it. <laughs> To be honest with you, I just didn't like it at all. His temper was like a black cloud when it came in full-blown, buddy. And he'd say things that you've never heard before in your life. He would string expletives together and make words that you've never, <laughs> never heard of. And he'd be mad, and, and, but he'd stay mad for maybe 30 minutes, and then it'd be over. He fired us en masse. Ten times. Every one of you guys, get the fuck out of here. Uh, go on home. I said, look, I quit. I'm out of here. He said, you can't quit. You're fired. I said, whatever, Elvis. I said, I'm out of here. So I start to go, leave the room. He gets around in front of me, confronts me. All of a sudden, he hit me. Went to his karate stance. My head just kind of turned like this here, and I turned around and I looked at him. He's the only man that ever hit me I didn't hit back. And I looked at him and I said, I never thought you could do that, Elvis. Tears started coming down my eyes. I turned and walked away. If I had hit him, I would have hurt him bad. Michael, I hit awful hard. My whole fighting situation was hit hard and fast and put him down. And I loved him too much to hit him. It's like hit my brother, you don't. At the house, we had this big marble table, you know. And basically, back then, karate was new to a lot of people. And so Elvis was, the subject got on karate, and Charlie Thompson says, oh, you get a good street fighter, and you get to throw in a good right or a roundhouse. He said to take a karate guy out in a minute. Of course, Elvis says, okay, let's try it. And they get up, and he, he positions Thompson right in front of the marble table. So Thompson says, okay. Elvis says, all right, go ahead and throw a punch. Well, he throws a punch. Elvis knocks his hand away and gives him the heel of his hand, and he goes <laughs> sailing across the marble table. But he gets up. He says, yeah, okay, but what if... And, and he says, what if what? He says, well, what if I come with a roundhouse? And said, Elvis says, well, go ahead. He comes with a roundhouse. Boom. Across the table again. He did that five or six times. Every time he got up, he said, what if? What if? That and, got to be the thing. <laughs> but, but what if? And finally, Elvis looked at him. He said, what if what now, Charlie? And Charlie sat down. Christmas time with Elvis naturally meant extravagant gifts. But Elvis had a way of handling people who got too greedy. We were getting ready to exchange gifts, and Elvis was upstairs, and he comes down, and he's, he's got all these envelopes in the hand. And there was one guy in particular who basically showed up at Christmas at no other time because he wanted to see what, you know, Elvis was going to give him. And so Elvis 
was very dramatic and he says, look, he said, I've done something special this year because I really feel you deserve what's in this envelope. And he hands them out to everybody. And this guy in particular, I'm looking at him and everybody's looking at him and he's saying, oh yeah, Elvis, which is the way he sometimes would talk. And he's opening up the envelopes because he's expecting something really special and he pulls it out of the envelope and his eyes just couldn't believe what he was looking at. It was a 50 cent McDonald's certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Although never mean-spirited, Elvis met with one case of greed that even he could not forgive. There was a guy working for him that first started forging Elvis's name on personal checks of Elvis that he carried around in his briefcase for him in case he never ever needed to want something to buy it. And uh, he's in Vegas and he's losing the money that he makes, his salary and per diem money and everything, and then he started forging Elvis's name on a personal check. So. He was let go and uh, told to go ahead and uh, go on back to, to Memphis. Then, before he was going to leave the next morning, Ellis found out that this guy had, already, had also gone into a private uh, compartment of Elvis that he had in there and found some personal pictures, Polaroid pictures, and uh, took some of them. Came out and showed them to some of us. We said, whoa, you know, I don't want to say what they were. So anyway, uh, Elvis got, found out about this and he stewed on it all night. And it just got him more and more and more mad. So <clears throat> all of a sudden the next morning he's w up way earlier than he normally gets up. So Red and Elvis went on out there to the plane and Elvis holds that badge up with his ID and is telling him to, whoa, stop the plane. Well, the pilot, thought that Elvis had missed the flight. He recognized Elvis, so he called back to the ground crew and told them to roll the steps back up. So they did. Elvis and Red went up the steps. The stewardess up there opens the door and they go inside. In the meantime, the pilot is there now. And Elvis comes up there and says, well, sorry, sir, to stop the plane, but we're looking for a fugitive. And he said, a fugitive? He said, aren't you Elvis Presley? He said, yes, but I'm also an agent. He showed him that bat. I'm a federal agent, and we're looking for this guy. He said, well, was he armed, or is he, is he uh, is he dangerous? And Elvis said, no, he's not dangerous, just something we need to take him in for some questioning and everything. And he said, well, I want my officers to go back there with you. So Red and this officer from the plane started back that way. And so Elvis asked the pilot, says, uh, what time y'all supposed to get in Memphis? He said, Memphis? He said, uh, Mr. Preston, we're going to San Francisco. <laughs> Elvis said, Red, come on, we got the wrong damn plane. And he called him back up, and Red come running back up, and they ran off the thing and came back in. I, in the meantime, come up behind him. About that time, here comes Elvis. He said, walking up, and he said, uh, James, you got the right to, to uh, and all that other shit. Get him in the car and let's go, guys. He couldn't think of the Miranda rights, and it was just all that other shit. Let's go. So we get in the car. Now, he's scared. We start driving away, Red's in the back with him. And I'm sitting up here driving, and he's sitting here, and all of a sudden he says, y'all take me out to the desert, ain't you? We said, no, James, we're not taking to the desert. He said, well, I, I want you to know, my daddy knows what time that plane comes in. If, if he doesn't, if I'm not on it, he's gonna wanna know why. And I said, well, we'll let him know why. And I said, James, you're not, you're not going anywhere. You're going to the hotel, I always wants to talk to you. When we got up there, here comes Elvis out of that bedroom Steps down those three steps, man, started walking, kind of tugs at his belt there and walks up to him and said, uh, why? Why did you do it? And James just sitting there, won't look up at him or anything. And I was like, son of a bitch, why? Like that. And Red and I both jumped, <laughs> but it was real quiet. We both jumped straight up. James, I don't know. And all of a sudden he says, tell me. And he reached over and he popped him. And a little ring, a, a ring in me, he made a little, little scratch thing on his forehead, a little trickle of blood starts to, he said, damn, see what you made me do, James. Someone get me a, a wet claw. <laughs> he was upset. He didn't mean to, hut, you know, to cut him or anything. So <clears throat> whoever was there went in and got a washcloth out of the, the guest uh, bathroom there. And he starts cleaning up James's head, trying to stop the blood and everything. And uh, then he just kind of sat back on the coffee table and said, James, why? Why would you do this? He said, then I thought I gave you guys anything you wanted. 
and then you turn around and you steal from me and you get in my business that you shouldn't be in? And James starts crying and saying, well, I didn't mean to. I, I, have a, I guess I have a gambling fever or something. I, and I said, that's not what I'm talking about, James. I said, that's one thing. I'm talking about taking my private possessions. He was thinking about those pictures. What was he going to go do with them or whatever? And he wanted to know why, and James couldn't answer him really. just said, I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't have. I'm very sorry. Elvis was getting warming up towards a guy. Now he was feeling sorry for him. You know, he'd gone past the anger, and now it was the other way. And Red and I looked at each other and said, uh-uh, Elvis. We knew where he was going. And he looked, and he said, you're right, you're right. I said, James, just go on back home. Go get your plane. Get on back home. Keep your mouth shut. Go out there, and Daddy will give you your weeks, your, your pay, and then that's it. You just keep your mouth shut. And he did. He went back, and that was it. But uh, As an overweight Elvis turned 40, Johnny Carson's wisecracks on that occasion got big laughs all over America, except around a certain TV set in Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis, they liked him, you know, watched him all the time. And this particular night, he come on and he said, uh, they was talking about entertainers and stuff like that, and Johnny Carson said, yeah, I hear Elvis is, is fat and 40. And he reached over and he got the remote control and he turned it off and he said, you know, he said, I never did. That's something that never was funny to me. He said, I never did like you. <laughs> We'd been up all night. All night. Which was every day. Which every was night, every yeah. night. So finally, I don't know, 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning, we were finally going to go to bed. So I, I took a, a sleeping pill, which we were all doing, to sleep. I thought it was, you know, we were finally going to get some rest. And I, I hadn't even gone to sleep yet, and I heard this knock. I always wanted to go over to the doctor to get, you know, get his throat, get his throat supposedly moisturized or whatever. And, that's, and I, I, I come storming out. I had, I had had all I could stand. I come storming out and say, "God damn it, man! Just go to sleep. You're gonna be all right. You know, you don't need to be doing this shit all the time." And he said, "What?" He went back in his bedroom and come out with this AK, whatever it was. And I, saw, I see him coming out of his room, and I'm coming out of my room, and this, this guy that worked for us, this is the funny part, he was between us walking toward Elvis, he saw this gun, he just, he was a very strange, we called him Brow, he just kind of eased over out of the way and <laughs> leaned, leaned against the wall, he was wait, waiting for the gunfire, you know, so go ahead and kill this son, bitch, I'm out of the way. I said, well, you know, if that's it, shoot. Red said, go ahead, Elvis, you can shoot me, is that what you want, go ahead. Just go ahead and blow my damn brains out. And Elvis looked and said, don't, don't push me, Red. And Red said, I'm not. And he walked. Red turned his head like that. And Elvis winked at me. We had a tragedy happen outside of Graceland. A woman and her little son, about, oh, three or four years old, were crossing Elvis Presley Boulevard. And she was also pregnant with another baby and got hit by a car and killed. And uh, I missed it by less than a minute or two because I was coming down with my wife, my little son in the car, and I see... Uh, people out there in the middle, the car stopped, and there's someone, and I said, oh, man. So I pulled out there, and I had a blue light. We had, some of us had blue lights that we could put on dashboard that the sheriff's department had given us. I put that on the dashboard and got the car parked so that people could see the blue light. And I went over there, and the little boy was laying there uh, on his stomach, and his head was turned, and he didn't really look like any big serious injuries, but he was, he was dead. And I walked over to uh, the mother, her eyes were rolled back and she was just moaning and she died on the operating table at emergency. So I told Elvis about it and uh, that night and I said their daughter and her husband had just gone to uh, left to go to Texas and her but the woman's husband was there and he had a, a serious injury with uh, a head injury or something not from this but from before. So the long story made short I went to Elvis he said Sonny pay for any flight or any way for them to get back here, uh, pick up the hotel, you know, put them in a motel, and any medical charges, get it done. Complete stranger. All I did was tell him about it. It just broke his heart. But that's the way Elvis was, and never wanted anyone to know about it. When just Elvis it. and his daddy fought, it was really bad. I mean, they, I mean, Gladys and him getting a fight, it was different. But boy, when Vernon and Elvis getting a fight, it was one of those bad, because Vernon had a very sharp tongue, and he, I mean, he could. And he had his it, own ego, too. Buddy. Yes, sir. And when they got an argument, I mean, boy, you cleared, the, the place cleared real fast because, you know, it was dangerous. I, I only saw a couple of arguments between uh, 
Elvis they were dad dangerous over those, Yeah, they and I'm dangerous. telling you, you could see Vernon Presley got the meanest, oh. boy, he could get mean as a snake with words and stuff. And start He'd get real quiet. He'd get real yeah, quiet. Yeah, and you could see it, you know, and uh, Elvis would try to hold it in, but at the same time, you could see Elvis was extremely angry too, boy. And two of them, you just didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, you really didn't. Those were I called dangerous arguments. I never thought of anything physical happening. It wasn't like a fight, but you never knew what was going to be said well, that you can't hardly take back later. You've already made the cut, man. I'll tell you, in line with that, we were sitting at Graceland about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Elvis had just gotten up and sitting in the dining room. He's eating breakfast. And uh, he's sitting there, and there's two or three of us around the table with him, we're just, you know, quiet. You know, you had to be quiet till he had his first or second cup of coffee and woke up a little. Never would, didn't like to talk business, certainly wouldn't do it until after he ate or whatever, and Vernon walked in and said, son, we got a problem. I don't want to hear it, Daddy. That's right. Did not, did not raise his head up. He still went on in. He said, I don't want to hear it right now. Vernon, I, I pictured, he's standing up against the wall by the windows in the dining room, and Vernon kept on. And Elvis said, I said, I don't want to hear it now. I don't want to talk about it now. And Vernon said something else. And Elvis looked at him and he says, look, God damn it. I said, I, I don't want, he said, you know better than to come talk to me about business before I've had my breakfast and what have you. And Vernon mouthed off at him. He says, look, I'm the goddamn boss here. Elvis said that to his father, and his father said, yeah, but you ain't man enough to make me do it. And Elvis says, well, by God, I am. He says, he says I'm a lot more man than you are, to his father. Oh, and Vernon said, no, not even half. And Elvis got up, picked up a chair and a plate, both at the same time, wham, across the room and went upstairs. If you got in the middle of it, the whole thing changed.